very welcome to the Herland Report, uh, Mr. Hendrik Weber. You are the president and founder of uh, People Diplomacy Norway, which is an uh, NGO and an organization that wish to push for peace in Europe. And is there anything we need today? It's more peace, more understanding, more cooperation, and more respect for uh, sovereign nations and their right to self-determination within That's their right. own borders. Uh, many of the perspectives that interest ordinary people, such as peace, we don't want war, isn't really heard in the media. And you have done something quite extraordinary because you have gone to Ukraine and to Crimea to speak to the people that actually live there to hear what is really going on behind that curtain which we hear so little about in our own media. So what did you experience when you went to Crimea with the delegation? And that's quite serious and uh, many of the perspectives that interest Ordinary people, such as peace, we don't want war, isn't really heard in the media. And you have done something quite extraordinary because you have gone to Ukraine and to Crimea to speak to the people that actually live there to hear what is really going on behind that curtain which we hear so little about in our own media. So what did you experience? when you went to Crimea with the delegation? Yes, we were there uh, last year with the uh, first Norwegian delegation. I've been there before in 2016, and uh, our main idea was to see what's going on there, how the people live. Is there any military on the street, like we hear in our Western medias? Uh, how does normal life work in, in Crimea? That was very interesting for us to, to see and we, we had the good opportunity to visit uh, in one week many different things. We have been in uh, different uh, cities like uh, Yalta, uh, for example, Sevastopol, Simferopol, and uh, talk to normal people. We see cultural things too. Uh, like the Chekhov house in uh, the famous Chekhov house in in Yalta, uh, but we even talked to politicians in uh, on Crimea, and that was very interesting to hear their side of the story, their view to the things was happening in uh, in uh, in the Ukraine. Um, yeah, so we use this opportunity to talk all these people to get another view and that we have here in our Western media. We know that one of the main problems in the Western media today, as we have a situation in the, in the United States that over 90% of the media is owned by only six corporations and half or more of those also own the weapons industry in the US. And we yes. are in the middle of a de-democratization process in, in America. And we look at the Ukraine crisis and what actually happened at the Maidan. I mean, it's confirmed now, WikiLeaks and, and so many sources have spoken about it. Even the snipers themselves uh, have, yes. have come up and, and, and explained that he, somebody paid somebody. Uh, and we've seen that the beneficiary of, of the change of regime in, in U Ukraine too has, you know, I mean, there, there seems to be like uh, such great geopolitical forces uh, working here. Mm -hmm. It looks for us that we're all doing this for democracy and peace. But um, behind that, it's only money and uh, power. Um, so the Maidan uh, crisis and, and all these things happened in 2013 and 14 has nothing to do with democracy or that we want peace in, uh, in, in the Ukraine. It has to do with money and with power uh, and from the US uh, and of course from, from Europe too. And we don't want to have this connection between Europe and uh, Russia, for example. And that's why we're using always the Ukraine to, to organize this crisis. <laughs> and we was uh, thinking that, that we have to have another view to this. And so we try to, to see the other side and then we use this opportunity to go to Crimea because Crimea is our, in our mainstream media always the thing that we say, 
Putin has taken Crimea, invaded Crimea with Russian soldiers, and, and that's why we have to have sanctions. That's why we, we cannot talk to Russian uh, authorities, because they have taken Crimea. And that's completely rubbish. It is, it's not true. It's uh, understandably a very complex uh, conflict and complex situation as on both sides or, or within the different groups. I mean, each ethnic group or, or cultural group have their own claim. And uh, I understand too that so many Russians are intermarried with Ukrainians and, and it's really such a tragedy, uh, the whole war in Ukraine and, and the crisis all together. Uh, I, I think there's a lot of pain in many Russians' heart uh, that I have spoken to and Ukrainians on the Kiev side as well, that, that people really feel the pain in all of this. But uh, to, to which degree are the Ukrainians and the Russians also used, do you think, in an even larger geopolitical uh, strategy uh, coming maybe from the United States in, in dividing people. This seems to be also uh, something that we see across, um, I'm thinking about Robert McNamara in uh, the famous documentary that uh, in which he spoke, The Fog of War. He, he states that this was precisely the problem that the Americans uh, engaged in, 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 in Vietnam, in, in siding with only the one warring party in a conflict that they didn't really understand. To what degree is this really, um, you know, relevant for, for, for the Ukrainian situation? That's a difficult question. As you say, it is a problem with many sides. But I think uh, for USA, it's very important that uh, Europe and Russia don't have a too close connection to each other, because together and together with Asia and China, maybe it will be uh, yeah, more than half of the peoples on the world and a very large market for for everything. So it will be a problem for, for USA to have this uh, big market or, or losing this market. So that's why I think they, they try to, um, they try to uh, do something against this close connection between Europe and Russia. And uh, they are using or they are using, uh, using Ukraine in this, in this relation to destroy this relationship. Many have commented on that, both uh, economists and others as well, that uh, due to the uh, sanctions that have been imposed on uh, Russia, it's really Europe that is suffering from it. And considering how the United States now is so heavily indebted, uh, I think over $20 trillion in debt, and, and we've seen the financial crisis 2007, 2008, just continuing now. I think uh, Jacob Rothschild uh, recently gave an interview saying we don't even know how this is going to end because we're just adding debt on top of uh, the debt we had, and who mm. knows? So, I mean, the US is in a crisis. I mean, it's a question also whether it's a deliberate uh, way of uh, pulling Europe down to infuse these kinds of sanctions and, um, you know, warring parties uh, on the border of Europe, which is re Ukraine too. Yes, I, th I think it's true. Uh, for U USA, it's not good to have a strong Europe. Uh, it's much more better if we have some conflicts in Europe and then we're only thinking by our own. Uh, that will be good for, for the USA because uh, then they are the strongest power and they can be the strongest power in the world. Uh, especially with their military, they're all over the world. And uh, of course, this crisis in Ukraine was uh, financed by peoples in USA. If I talk about USA, I only mean the government, of course, not the normal, uh, normal citizens. The, the old economy financed all these crises all over the world, and in, in the Ukraine, the same. I understand that uh, pertaining to Crimea, uh, approximately 90% of the population there are of Russian descent or Russians, is that, is that correct? No, it's not so high, this, uh, this number is not so high, but of course the most people on Crimea have Russian roots or have something to do with Russia. They have 
lived in Russia before or they have family in Russia. So it was very clear in 2014 that uh, most people would choose a reunion with Russia. And uh, we, have, uh, we have talked to many people, to politicians and uh, normal people on the street, and they, are, they feel very happy with that uh, reunion with Russia. And they say, maybe we, can be, uh, maybe we can be a part of Ukraine, but what will happen with these fascists and this uh, new regime men in Kiev? It is not a legal government there. It is uh, an unlegal and criminal government. Um, so we are very happy with this now to be a part of the Russian Federation. To what degree do you think that a geopolitical uh, strategy from NATO and, and the US actually to cut uh, Russia off from, from its harbors in, 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 in the Black Sea? Mm. Sevastopol and on Crimea is, uh, I think, is the only harbor of, in, the, um, in the Black Sea that uh, Russia had had. Um, but they have a normal rental contract with the, with Ukraine, and of course, for uh, for the NATO, it will be good if this connection can be cut off. Um, but it is not possible now because uh, now Crimea is a legal part from from the Russian Federation, and uh, I think that is uh, very good. And this solution it was was the only possible solution. It's interesting here how. Um people, diplomacy, Norway, how you've also taken initiatives and been very highly criticized in the leading uh, pro-American, uh, leading newspapers that we have here, uh, too, from, from taking a trip to Donetsk now. And uh, tell us about that. I mean, we have these two, uh, you know, Donetsk and, and Luhansk in, in the eastern part of, of, of Ukraine. Who did you meet when you go there? I, I gather you just recently came back from, from meeting with the president in, in that uh, yes, we meeting, republic. Uh, yes, we was in, in that uh, Donetsk People Republic. And uh, the same reason there, like in, uh, in on Crimea, we want to see the other side, we want to hear what they are believing and thinking. And our Western media is only standing there are living terrorists and separatists, but uh, we think maybe it's uh, several thousand, but it is more millions, it's five million people together in uh, Donbass region. And uh, we have the opportunity to talk uh, to normal people on the streets, we was in schools and hospitals, but we even talked to the to the president himself, Alexander Sachenko, and uh, because we want to hear his side of the story, and uh, it took us a while bef before he um, believed us that we come without any answer. We was not uh, we was open to hear his version of the history, and um, after a while we had a good contact with him and we can ask him many different things. And we was together with him in four or five hours. It was a really uh, great uh, meeting. And we get a lot of information to take with us here to Europe. It's, uh, it's interesting too, uh, just to, to reflect, because um, when you come to a place uh, such as Donbass, uh, and you come on a mission like uh, what you do in trying to understand the other side of a conflict or in trying to acquire information about uh, the sides of conflicts that we do not hear anything about or actually never hear about in our pro-American or, uh, you know, media, mainstream media here in, in Scandinavia, for example, and in Norway. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting too because uh, do you really get objective information when you go to places like that? When we compare to the Syrian situation, for example, it's extremely controlled which Syrian oppositional groups are allowed to speak to Western journalists coming from the pro-American uh, uh, mainstream media type, let's say the leading newspapers in Norway, for, for example. I mean, or, or it's extremely controlled who in Syria is allowed to speak to scientists or historians or, or you know, I mean, people who, who, who write 
right? Um, yeah. uh, researchers on, on the Syrian war. So this is how it's very easily controlled what comes out in the Western media. Wouldn't you say you would experience the same thing once you try to speak to uh, the Russian? The situation in Donbass is another situation and on Crimea. Um, but uh, Donetsk is, uh, the People's Republic of Donetsk is really in a war with uh, Ukraine. I, I don't believe and I don't read anything about that in our newspapers. But when I was there, we was on the front line only 400 meters away, and we hear shooting, uh, um, and, and we see that it's a war going on there. People living in cellars, in, in destroyed houses, and it's, it's really terrible, the situation. We don't read something about that here in our Western media. And uh, of course, when we talk to the government there, we hear their side of the story. That's, that's true. Uh, but when we go to the White House, we hear their story. Um, but I think we have to bo have both stories to make us a real picture. And for me, it was clear that without any dialogue between Ukraine, Europe and the Donetsk People's Republic, we never will stop this war. It is, uh, it is very important that we, that we take these people with in a dialogue to, to change the situation there. I'm thinking about also Western media and the way we see, uh, we write about things. I mean, it's uh, whenever you hear a name, let's say the president of, of some, you know, they always write pro-Russian yeah. or separatist or, and then you have the, the way we use words uh, in a very much a propaganda way, really, who's a terrorist and who's a freedom fighter. Uh, you know, I mean, is this one of the main reasons why we hear so little about other explanations uh, than only that one side of it that we hear in the in the Western media. Mm. I don't know. I, I I can think about that. That is very easy if we can say, okay, this is terrorist. This is a good guy. This is a bad guy. For us, it's easy. Um, but that is not the truth. We have to read more. We have to have more information, background information, and. Today, with the internet, it's possible to get this information. Everybody can get this information. Why we don't do it? Why are we only reading our newspapers or telling us rubbish all the day? Um, we have to, to travel maybe to... Not everybody can do this, but if it's possible, do it. Travel in these countries and then we will see that they are living normal people. If you are in Donetsk uh, city, you will think that it's a normal city in Europe, like any other city. You don't see the war in the city center, but if you're going a little bit outside, there is a completely other situation. So that is a, a war going on in Europe, and, and uh, we don't read something about that. Or if we read something about that, it's only from one side. It's a serious uh, situation, uh, this too, pertaining to the freedom of speech and the freedom of press um, in the West, because this used to be a very vital uh, value in the Western system uh, that distinguished uh, the Western system from many other that we would say were more totalitarian or more, uh, you know, I mean, uh, dictatorships and all that one was not allowed. That's precisely one of the issues that, that you know, defines a dictatorship. You're not allowed to see different sides of, of a problem. And, and this is deeply problematic for many of us that we seem to go more and more in line with uh, totalitarian uh, traits in the West, isn't that the irony? It is, but it, it goes in this direction. It looks like it goes in this direction. Um, so it is, uh, it is more difficult to get, um, or in the newspaper, you don't get uh, any different uh, meanings. You can only read one thing. And all the pictures in every article comes from uh, DPA or other news uh, uh, agencies. So I'm, I'm thinking, what, what are these journalists doing in our newspapers? Why they are going not out and, and talk to people? Um, it seems like they're sitting only in their office and <laughs> paste and copy, uh, do paste and copy work. Uh, 
and it, that, that is not good, of course. We have to change that. That is quite a paradox, and we see it here in Norway very much so. I mean, uh, many refer to Norway as the best country in the world. I think that's quite a myth. Uh, obviously, we have the oil, and due to that, and if you divide that on the very few people that live here, the amount of people, of course, you'll get a, a high degree of, you know, I mean, we're, we're rich. This is no question about that. Uh, but but it's also a, a question really about how how free we, we we really are pertaining to much of the lack of information we get. And many journalists who live in Norway uh, clearly state that they are told point frank, um, you know, to just copy the, yeah, what's, yeah. what's ever written in the you know, the, the, the leading new mainstream media here, and it's deeply problematic because I think there's many journalists that would like to look at, not to say that the, the Russians are always correct in mm. stating what they do, or, or the Americans are always wrong, or, or vice versa. It's just that we would really like to have a bit more freedom so that we are allowed to read uh, different articles mm. and may make up our minds. That's kind of like the protest coming from, 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 from many. Yes, that's right. And um, if you read the comments under, under these uh, newspaper articles on, on the internet, then you see that people want to have another side. The people don't believe longer uh, to this easy story. There are the terrorists and here are living the only the good guys. Um, so that's why I think blogs and something like that are so famous and popular to, to get other, uh, other sides of the history, to see other points. Um, so and, and, and it will be more, I think, in, in the future. Thank you very much for taking the time, uh, Mr. Hendrik Weber. And we Thank know you. that People's Diplomacy Norway is only one organization. These organizations are now all over Europe. It seems to be a trend that um, the people of Europe are rising up saying, we would like to have a break away from this one-sidedness and please allow us to listen to the different stories. And maybe then we will have some more peace and less war in Europe. So thank you very much for coming and sharing your thoughts. Thank you.